Hello, I'm Carl Rodriguez, Acting Deputy Head for the Australian Space Agency. Ahead of the roundtable discussion, I wanted to focus on the topic opportunities and projects for the sustainable use of small satellites for space research. I will do this by highlighting some projects that the agency is funding, as well as other industry examples that are helping transform our space sector. Our International Space Investment Initiative is an investment of $15 million over three years to support Australian participation in space activities internationally. It supports strategic space projects that build relationships with international space agencies and companies with its purpose to grow Australia's space sector capability. The initiative is currently being rolled out and it includes 10 projects to support industry growth from CubeSats, artificial intelligence and automation to the next generation of spacesuits. Four projects as part of this investment have a small satellite focus. The first is a microsatellite constellation launch system by Skycraft. This includes the design and qualification of a satellite system for the deployment of Australian-designed microsatellites into low Earth orbit. The second is a decision support system for collision avoidance of space objects from the Industrial Science Group. This software will help satellite operators assess risks to satellites from collisions with other satellites in space debris. The third is an advanced GNSS receiver for CubeSats rockets and remote sensing from the University of New South Wales. This project will modernise and extend the only Australian and New Zealand single frequency GPS receiver. This project will make the receiver fully capable of being used with multiple frequencies, antennas and systems. The fourth, the Spirit CubeSat mission in particular, is a project being led by the University of Melbourne. This mission will break new ground in high-performance autonomous operations, communications, propulsion and thermal management. One main payload for advanced X-ray remote sensing will be on board, known as the Hermes constellation. This has been developed for this project with funding from the Italian Space Agency and the European Commission. This will be able to quickly spot gravitational wave events by detecting the X-rays they emit and use triangulation to help determine the direction of the source. This project will also demonstrate the viability of Australian products in the global supply chain of satellite components. CSIRO is also collaborating with Innovor Technologies, a South Australian-based satellite company, to design and build a CubeSat with a suite of infrared sensors. The satellite is called CyroSat-1. The satellite is being supported by a collaboration with various research organisations, including the University of New South Wales, Canberra, the Australian National University Advanced Instrumentation and Technology Centre, and the Defence Science and Technology Group, who are supporting the mission design, testing and commissioning. It is a research and development platform that will inform our ability to design, build and operate future satellites that could track fires and study the formation of clouds and tropical. Linking back to the topic of focus, the highlighted projects can help support the sustainable use of small sats in a variety of ways. By ensuring the safety and positioning of satellites in orbit to avoid collision risks, by providing performance and accuracy improvements both in timing, position and or velocity estimation due to improved GNSS receivers, and by demonstrating the, vi the viability of Australian products and materials in the global supply chain of satellites. Overall, these projects can help support and inform future satellite small satellite missions going forward from both technology and research perspectives. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wang Tzu from the National Space Science Center, Chinese Academy of Sciences. I would like to discuss two topics. One is about the space weather mission and the ground-based monitoring network in China. And the other is about the international collaboration in the lunar and the planetary exploration. Solar activity is the main driving source of space weather. ASOS is the first Chinese solar mission to study two types of solar storms, solar flare, and chloral mass ejections, and their relationship with the solar magnetic field. It will be launched in early 2022. As the solar storms hit Earth, 
we need to understand the response of the geospace. The SMILE mission is a joint mission between the European Space Agency and China to investigate the solar wind magnetosphere interaction in a global manner. It will be launched by the end of 2024. China has also developed a ground-based program to monitor the key space environment parameters. The Meridian project will consist of more than 300 ground-based instruments in 36 observing stations across China. As the international extension of the Meridian project, the International Meridian Circle Program, IMCP, is proposed to collect the 120 degree east longitude and the 60 degree worst longitude chance of ground based monitors to obtain the full coverage of the geospace process worldwide. As for the lunar and the planetary exploration, China plans to go to the Moon, Mars, Asteroid, and the Jupiter system by 2030. In January 2019, the Chang'e 4 probe landed on the far side of the Moon for the first time. Chang'e 4 carried four international payloads developed by the Netherlands, Sweden, and Germany. With the astronaut sample return mission planned in 2025, China has called for proposals on eight types of scientific instruments on board this mission among universities and research organizations, both at home and abroad. In the future, China has initiated the International Lula Research Station, which is to be located in the Lula South Pole region. It will be developed through a number of upcoming robotic Chang'e missions across the 2020s and expanded through the 2030s. Both North Cosmos and the European Space Agency had discussions with China with regard to contributing to this project. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, every other year, the COSPAR Assembly is a highlight event that brings together the global space research community and let me first express my gratitude to Australia for organizing this 43rd assembly in such difficult times. CNES was the first international partner to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Australian Space Agency as early as 2018. One of the first concrete steps of this cooperation was a partnership with UNSW Canberra to develop the Australian National Concurrent Design Facility. It is my honor here to say a few words about CNES actions in space research, which is built on international cooperation serving the global community. The past and coming two years are packed with exciting science in all domains. Nicola Kopernik will certainly forgive me for saying that today the center of the solar system is Mars, with three missions currently approaching the Red Planet. We will particularly be following the landing of the Perseverance rover with the French SuperCam instrument on board. In the solar system exploration category, let me mention also ESA Solar Orbiter mission to which CNES is contributing, which is now beginning to acquire science data as it approaches to within 40 million kilometers of the Sun becoming the first space probe to observe its poles directly and the return of tiny particles collected from asteroid Rugu by Japan Sayabusa 2 mission that will be the subject of extensive scientific investigation this year. 
soon to be sent to the L2 second Lagrange point, 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, ESA Euclid the mission will seek to unlock the secrets of dark matter and dark energy. Back in the vicinity of Earth, but still in the field of exploration, ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet from France will be flying again to the International Space Station this spring. There will be 14 French scientific experiments on board. Last but not least, CNES has been committed to studying our planet and is changing climate ever change since its inception and this is continuing. We are working to support concrete actions like the Space Climate Observatory to which 27 space agencies and governmental organizations have already signed up. The US French SWAT mission is in final development stage, progressing well in spite of the logistic challenges posed by the pandemic. This year, the MRA3 and Stratol 2 scientific balloon flight campaigns will enable research into Earth's upper atmosphere, while Sentinel-6A will take over the operational responsibility of extending the landmark sea-level climate data record initiated by Topex Poseidon. 2021 also marked the 60th anniversary of CNES inception. I'm very proud to report on our activities, which owes so much to our agencies engineers and to our national space sector, research institutions, space manufacturers and downstream sectors, startups, administrations, and of course, our international partners. Our conviction is that they are all part of the same space environment and that investing in science, research and development is a way to keep innovation going and to push the boundaries of progress. Science is our cultural heritage and our future. Let us preserve it. Dear colleagues, the modern scientific community faces global challenges. Our changing climate is just one example why space research and the cooperation promoted by the COSPAR Scientific Assembly are more important today than ever before. At the German Aerospace Center, our 10,000 employees share our common drive to explore Earth and space and to develop technologies that will enable a sustainable future and growing economies. Remote sensing data produced at DLR, for example, is used to document the effects of climate change and to detect and analyze crop failures. DLR also works closely with humanitarian aid organizations. We offer them precise and timely geographic information available to aid workers on the ground. The satellite information allows them to quickly gain an overview of situations that require a rapid response. Meanwhile, our mobile greenhouses demonstrate how technology developed for space research can be applied on Earth. In addition to supplying astronauts with tomatoes and lettuce, these greenhouses could be used to provide fresh food for people in crisis areas who have lost their primary sources of nutrition. Space debris is another growing concern that many of us here are actively engaged in. The scientific and commercial use of space depend on the avoidance and removal of this debris. Researchers at the DLR Institute of Technical Physics are working on a laser-based observation method to precisely determine the positions of objects in Earth's orbit. We combine time-of-flight measurements made using a laser with its position in the sky. By doing so, we can determine objects orbiting at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers to within just a few meters. These precise measurements will enable satellite operators to conduct more efficient collision avoidance maneuvers. 
Such research requires investment. Ideally, this can take the form of new institute, such as the Institute for Solar Terrestrial Physics. Here, we study the effects of space weather on the crucial power grids and satellite navigation and communication infrastructures. Regarding the space economy, it is clear that new space practices are driving and shaping the current growth. DLR places great importance on the support and promotion of startups in the space industry and the application of space technologies on Earth. Caring for the elderly and infirm using robotics technologies originally developed for use in space is just one example of this. As researchers and engineers, we are convinced that our joint research is capable of crossing borders, connecting nations, and bringing together people from different cultures. I wish you all many interesting discussions, new insights, and success at COSPAR 2021. The Hellenic Space Center is one of the youngest, if not the youngest, space agencies worldwide. It was established one year ago and still struggles to overcome the bureaucratic hurdles associated with every single step towards full functionality. Being part of the wider public sector, we have to observe very strict rules regarding procedures and in particular regarding employment. Therefore, staffing has been extremely slow paced. Nevertheless, we have already launched activities that do not require staff besides our governing board, which is composed by leading scientists and engineers of our country. Our activities so far include, first, advice to the Minister of Digital Governance on space-related issues and activities, Second, consultation with academia and industry. And third, contact with non-governmental initiatives of young space enthusiasts. Our advice to the minister has focused on Greek participation to programs of the European Space Agency and of the European Union, and on the representation of Greece uh, on program boards of these two organizations and also on the development and implementation of a small satellites national program. The consultation with academia and industry is regarded by us as a prerequisite for the effective role of the Hellenic Space Center in coordinating and promoting the synergy of research institutions and private companies in projects of mutual interest for the national benefit. We have had very fruitful interactions so far, and we are looking forward to the definition and support of joint projects. Last but not least, through our contacts with aspiring young scientists and engineers, we aim at identifying initiatives that deserve support and should be included in the framework of capacity building. Thank you for your attention. Dear leaders of space agencies participating in this roundtable, members of the COSPA Scientific Assembly, warm greetings to you all from Indian Space Research Organization. It's my pleasure to join my fellow panelists uh, and address you all on India's and ISRO's perspective on international cooperation in space, science, and planetary exploration. Continuing with the fruitful missions to explore Moon with Chandrayaan-1 and 2, Mars with MOM-1, ISRO is planning to follow on missions to these bodies and also missions to new destinations. ISRO is gearing up to launch the Aditya L1, India's first mission to study the Sun. This spacecraft will be placed in a halo orbit around the Lagrangian point 1 of the Sun-Earth system and will be continuously viewing the Sun without any occultation or eclipses to generate significant science outcome. Another interesting science mission will be the ExpoSat, the X-ray polarimeter satellite, slated for launch by mid-2021. 
This will be the India's first dedicated polarimetry mission to study various dynamics of the astronomical sources in extreme conditions. The scientific outcome of, of the above two missions will, be, will offer a great opportunity for the international cooperation. Already ESA and NASA have expressed interest to work with ISRO on the science of Aditya L1 mission. Further, ISRO plans for a broader international cooperation in this upcoming satellite missions to explore Venus as well. Through international announcement of opportunity, ISRO has already selected scientific payloads from Russia, France, Germany and Sweden. India's third mission to moon Chandrayaan-3 will have a NASA instrument, the Laser Reflectrometer Array, which will serve as a location marker for future lunar missions. ISRO is in active discussion with JAXA to, re to realize a joint mission to the polar region of the moon as well. ISRO has embarked on an ambitious human spaceflight program aimed to fly internationals to space from Indian soil and bring them back safely. This will be the stepping stone for creating a sustained human presence in space in the future uh, for India. ISRO is working with the space agencies of Russia, France, Japan and USA on this important mission. ISRO is also contributing to the global space science community with the current space missions such as the onboard instrument of AstroSat carried out phase resolved polarization studies of the emissions from the Crab Nebula system. This unique polarimetry study has raised new challenges to understand high polarization emissions during off-peak phase intervals. Another instrument led to the discovery of the UV photons from epoch of reionization. The Mars Color Camera, the Mars Orbiter mission, has produced more than 1,100 images so far. Using these images, ISRO has prepared the Mars Atlas. Using the data from Chandrayaan-2 Orbiter, the highest resolution optical image of lunar surface and the first full parametric measurement of permanently shadowed regions of the largest surface composition study of Moon are carried out. All these data and other scientific outputs are made available to the global scientific community for conducting focused research. I also would like to touch upon the recent reforms announced in the Indian space sector. With the emergence of technology advances in this area, communication, data revolution, India is witnessing a new business spirit and enthusiasm in industries and startups in space systems and services, which is going to create a new space technology ecosystem in this country. To meet the challenges and to proactively build conducive atmosphere for more entrepreneurial participation in space sector, India has announced space sector reforms recently. Today, we are looking at space as a means for furthering human knowledge through explorations while having opportunities that would unveil new business and drive growth. For this to happen, space must be safe, secure and readily accessible to all. In this context, I want to say that India is in the forefront of the global platforms for evolving guidelines to ensure long-term sustainability of space activities. My greetings once again to COSPA 2021 Scientific Assembly. I thank you all for this opportunity. ISAS JAXA is promoting asteroid explorations such as Hayabusa 2 illustrated in this page. The original Hayabusa was launched in 2003 and rendezvoused with asteroid Itokawa in 2005 and then came back to Earth in 2010. Based on the achievement of Hayabusa project, ISAS JAXA developed Hayabusa 2, which was launched in 2014 arrived at asteroid Ryugu in 2018 and then brought back asteroid material on December 2020. They are very tiny spacecraft with about 600 kg, powered by fuel-effective ion engines. This is the comparison with two target asteroids, Itokawa and Ryugu. Itokawa is an oval-shaped stone-type asteroid with 500 meters as tip-to-tip -tip rings. On the other hand, Ryugu is a spinning top shape, carbon-rich asteroid with 1 km diameter. On July 11, 2019, Hayabusa 2 executed the second touchdown operation and the material sampling near the artificial crater. The spacecraft is hovering 10 meters above and then descend and uh, touch down and ascend. Many boulders are scattered surrounding.
Hayabusa 2 came back to us and dropped the sample return capsule, which landed on Australia Umera on December 6, 2020. After transportation from Umera to JAXA Sagamihara campus on December 8, a walk then began to open the sample container inside the sample return capsule. On December 15th, an existence of black sand, thought to be derived from acid ryugu, was confirmed to be inside. The largest grain is estimated 1 cm diameter and Total collected sample will be about 5.4 grams of materials. ISAS JAXA and Hayabusa 2 project are supported by international space community from US, Germany, France, and Australia. NASA supplied DSN tracking support and exchange opportunity. Of asteroid materials between Osiris Rex and Hayabusa 2 in order to maximize asteroid science. DLR and CNES delivered mascot lander. Under COVID 19 situation, Australia accepted JAXA's 70s personnel of capsule return team. I would like to express our gratitude to Australia government, South Australia government. Australia Space Agency, Australia DOD, Australia Border Control, Umera Resident, Australia Embassy at Japan, and so on. Hello, I'm Andrew Johnson. Despite its challenges, 2020 was a successful year for the New Zealand space sector. We had six successful launches from New Zealand, including deploying our first student payload. We are already preparing for the first launch of 2021. We're partnering with the Environmental Defence Fund in the MethaneSat satellite mission. The mission will use the latest scientific and technological innovations in sensor design, spectroscopy, data retrieval algorithms, and flux inversions to distinguish anthropogenic emissions from ambient sources and trace them back to their origin. New Zealand will take responsibility for mission operations and establish an atmospheric science program on agricultural methane that will complement the mission's main science on oil and gas industry emissions. Under agreements with NASA and Air New Zealand, next generation GNSR receivers for the Cygnus mission will be installed on domestic aircraft and will collect soil moisture data as they fly across the country. The data will be used for scientific research into global water cycle processes and their interaction with climate, including effects such as flooding, droughts, and coastal erosion. Last year, we ran a series of virtual workshops with researchers at DLR, the German Space Agency, and in New Zealand to explore collaboration opportunities in propulsion, synthetic aperture radar, and optical communications technologies. We've just completed a call for proposals for phase A studies on these three topics and look forward to some really exciting projects emerging from this. New Zealand is exploring innovation in areas such as propulsion to make space more accessible and sustainable. Our key initiatives include trials to integrate controlled airspace high altitude vehicles and horizontal launches being developed and tested in New Zealand. New Zealand is also funding research for developing ion thrusters incorporating superconducting magnets on spacecraft. Sustainable use of space is not just about science and technology. Policy, regulation, and international cooperation are critical to ensure that we can continue to have access to space for scientific endeavours. New Zealand's regulatory regime requires that licensing decisions carefully consider the risks. Of orbital debris before granting permits for launch. We continue to trial LeoLab's tracking service for satellites launched from New Zealand, incorporating data from LeoLab's phased array radar system, including their radar here in New Zealand. We also work multilaterally through the UN COPUS, as well as with other countries, on developing and implementing good practices for ensuring space sustainability. I'd like to commend our Australian cousins and hosts. 
and the Coast Bar Secretariat for enabling this hybrid meeting. I look forward to listening to the other presentations and the panel discussion. Hello, dear colleagues. I decided to devote my short presentation here to international collaboration in space. It is well known that the joint effort ensures the best possible quality of space science, allows to share the spendings. Though sometimes such a deep collaboration looks like an extra management burden, but in the long run, it definitely pays off. In the Soviet space program, despite all the secrecy, there was a broad experience of the international collaboration in space science. And this approach continues now. International programs are of high priority to Iki and Roscosmos. Starting from a simple examples, more than a dozen instruments by Space Research Institute we have flown since the start of the 21st century on European, American, Japanese planetary spacecraft. Russian instruments are selected for the future Indian Venus and Chinese asteroid mission. A number of payloads, mostly from European partners, are being prepared to launch on the nearest Russian missions. But delivery of small instruments is not just all what we have. The brightest recent example is Spectrum RG mission, which maps the X-ray universe with two telescopes, one German and one Russian. After one year, the map already includes a million of sources and three years are still ahead. Finally, we will have the data for the decades of future scientific analysis. It is only with this joint effort the project could work out. Another example is a difficult path of the ExoMars project. ExoMars Orbiter was finally flown in 2016 on a Russian rocket with two core Russian instruments on board. We got very interesting results on details of water ice on Mars and on minor components in the atmosphere. We are in a final stage of preparation of ExoMars lander and rover, which involve an unprecedented level of technical interdependence. We are expecting very high scientific return with the launch in 2022. In the frame of, of the ExoMars project, we also have accomplished one more very important technical challenge with the mission ground support. For the first time, the Russian antennas regularly received the data from the European Deep Space spacecraft. In 2020, more than 70% of ExoMars data were received in Russia. Test reception was performed also with Mars Express. On the other hand, East Track Network helped a lot to cover poor visibility of Spectrum RG from the Russian territory in the April-May 2020. During the next year, the tests of uplink will be performed. This effort creates a very solid basis for the next joint projects. Future missions are continuing this pursuit. In the Russian lunar program, a significant European participation is planned with such core elements as safe landing and regular drill. Several agreements are signed on lunar exploration by Roscosmos and Chinese Space Agency. We hope that these projects, the first of which should be launched in 2021, will open the way for a deeper international effort on the moon surface. Just to mention about this year, a joint Iki NASA working group is discussing the future flagship Venus project. Finally, I would like to thank COSPAR for the organization of these meetings of all agencies and for the principal support of collaboration in space science. However, we are entering now a very important historical moment when we need to define the post-ISS construction and the renewal of the human space flight to the moon. We have a challenge to extend the spirit of collaboration on the exploration agenda. And I'm sure COSPAR can play a very productive role here. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Günter Hasinger. I'm the director of the ESA scientific program. And we'll, I will concentrate today on space weather and international cooperation. This is the fleet of the e of ESA in the solar system, and you see that it is concentrated uh, towards the currently towards the inner solar system where space weather happens. In March 2020, no, in February 2020, we we launched Solar Orbiter, studying the inner workings of the Sun, and already in the very first pictures that we received. We have discovered uh, a new phenomenon, campfires on the sun, which may very well be um, contributing or responsible for the heating uh, of the sun. And Solar Orbiter uh, has received um, a number of awards uh, at the end of last year, 
uh, and is um, promising a great future. Now, um, in parallel, we have um, uh, Pepe Colombo on its way to Mercury. And um, this year, last year, uh, it has flown by both Earth, as you see above, and Venus, as you see in the movie below, working its way to the inner solar system, but simultaneously measuring already the solar wind and the plasma together with the other missions that we have in orbit, uh, solar orbiter, cluster, Pepe Colombo, Swarm, and others work together like an orchestra uh, with different uh, instruments. And some exciting new results are coming out, in particular um, studying the aurora. And um, this is a beautiful picture from the space station taken by uh, Tim Peake. Taking together many, many measurements from cluster and many, uh, many other spacecrafts, um, scientists recently have understood better how the magnetic substorms are created, which are disrupting the aurora um, and are creating some of the space weather. And just a few days ago, um, we have released uh, a new study from SWARM, uh, which actually indicates that the northern hemisphere is much stronger in, state, in space weather than the southern hemisphere. And this is due to the tilt and also the offset of the magnetic field. This is great prospect for this mission SMILE, which is a joint mission between ESA and NASA, sorry, between ESA and uh, uh, CAS, where we actually are planning to continuously observe the aurora on the northern pole, uh, and the mission will be launched um, in a few years from now. Now coming to the astrophysics fleet, uh, where our current working horses are Hubble, Gaia, Keops, XMM, Newton, and Integral, and I just want to show you two very nice results from uh, one from XMM Newton and one uh, from Hubble, uh, showing the power again of international uh, cooperation. So in uh, this picture, uh, a cluster, a very large cluster of galaxies has been observed both uh, with uh, the optical telescope Subaru, with the X-ray telescope XMM Newton, and in the radio. And you see that the different components of the cluster, the normal gas, which is appearing green and red here, and the dark matter, which is appearing blue, are actually well separated, uh, again indicating that dark matter is a substance of its own. And Hubble Space Telescope has recently made a study where they looked at one of these uh, very strong uh, clusters and they were able to make a model of the dark matter. Uh, and have actually found that the dark matter is much more clumped and much more clustered than originally anticipated. And this is actually um, a possible explanation is that dark matter is made up of primordial black holes, which is getting uh, new interest. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you and um, uh, wait for an um, interesting discussion. Hey, I'm Thomas Surbogan, the head of science at NASA, and I'm so excited to be part of this important panel. From decades of experience, NASA knows that leveraging the power of its relationships accomplishes big goals. At NASA, we do that daily, in space and on the ground, and by doing so, we improve the lives of people on Earth while advancing our understanding of this planet and of space. Because we inherently value diversity and principles of openness and transparency, NASA has and will continue to set the standard for peaceful cooperation among diverse nations. More than half of our cooperation is with a small group of about eight valued countries, but in recent years, there has been a wonderful growth of nations of all sizes showing an interest in space, whether they have had their own space agencies or not. They all have scientists making discoveries, and the inspiration of the world's ever-growing accomplishments in space is not limited to borders. We know that we need to extend our relationships and publicly available data, tools, and expertise to emerging partners. So by growing our cooperation and increasing our nations we partner with, we know that we will all learn new approaches and perspectives and make new discoveries on behalf of all of humanity. I think organizations like COSPAR share my view that science spurred by diversity of opinion and backgrounds can help bring hope in this uncertain times and help us collectively solve our problems and unify us all as one 
species of explorers. This is why I'm excited to announce a new opportunity for partnership today that we believe will fit well within CLOSPAR. This initiative builds on what NASA already does so well, encouraging partners to grow and learn together with us as we collectively advance civilization level science. The kinds of things that make all humanity gasp in awe, like the first images we returned from Mars, or the first time we set foot on the moon. On the recent agreement with the United Office for Outer Space Affairs, we will be working closely to leverage our publicly available scientific data and support new and innovative commercial partnerships with American companies to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which seek to create a safe and prosperous future for all of humanity to enjoy. The agreement also supports the work of COSPAR to establish norms of behavior and principles such as transparency and due regard that provide the clarity necessary for safe operation in space. In addition, we soon will issue a request for information from U.S. institutions on innovative ways to increase the mission development capacity of our newer partners. We will seek the best ideas that will support students and early career professionals from emerging partner countries and enable them to work side by side and learn from our experts as they develop already funded CubeSats and SmallSat projects or their own projects as they want to bring these to the table. Our hope is that this hands-on experience will build upon the scientific method that we've already pursued and in the conduct of Earth and space science and provide a new and useful platform for our collaboration with emerging partners. And it's an approach we are focused on in our new missions as well, to try and do important science with smaller spacecraft, smaller missions. We intend our first mission development activities to be focused on space weather and heliophysics science. Consistent with COSPAR's task group for constellations of small sats and the goals of NASA's agreement with UNOSA, we help to contribute to an international constellation of space weather small satellites. A request for information will come out shortly that will be broad enough to allow for multiple avenues to accomplish that objective. I'm really looking forward to the release of this request because I truly believe that it will help us build and extend our relationship with new partners and create a more inclusive world where the power of science for all unites and provides hope for nations of all sizes and capabilities in this amazing global act of exploration in which we all take part in some form. By leveraging innovative partnerships involving governments, institutions, and even commercial companies, we can increase capability and capacity worldwide and create a future in which more of us can even make greater contributions to expanding the frontiers of human knowledge and our understanding of Earth and space. I know that with the dedication and creativity of the Coast Park community and with the help of our many friends and partners who share our passion for the great pursuit of knowledge about our planet and the universe, we can help build a common foundation for greater scientific discoveries. It will be a foundation on which the next generation can build and one that inspires and contrib contributes to much needed sense of amazement, wonder and hope for the future. So to everyone, I thank you and I look forward to continue to work with you this year and many years to come. Thank you so much.